Welcome back. How was lunch? Worked for you? You got a good lunch break out of that? How many of you have found your new accountability partner? That person that's going to irritate you once a week to make sure that you're ready to apply what you've learned? And by a round of applause, how many of you have at least one, two, or three key insights from each of our morning speakers? Let me hear from you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So, so they are thought leaders. There's no question about it. These, these are really powerful thought leaders who have come up with their own intellectual property and have shared that with you here today. However, uh, oftentimes our guests share with us, you know, Bill, that, that was really great, but, but how do we really apply that in our world of work? What, what can we do in our world of work to really make that happen? And that's why we have this next portion of the day, which is the executive panel. And so when I do this, if I do this effectively, one of the things that's going to happen is that you're going to feel as though you're eavesdropping in on a conversation between four executives. Now, how this is going to roll is that I'm going to sit down and talk with them for about 30 minutes or so, then I'm going to come into the audience and look for questions and answers from you, or questions from you that they will answer. So, so prepare yourself with some questions. But here today to join me on this stage, Karen Collins, the Chief Talent Officer of BMO. Dennis Hoffman is the Vice President of Sales, Dell Technologies. Robert Hosking is the Senior Vice President of Managing Director of Search Practice for LHH Knightsbridge. And Sandy McIntosh is the Executive Vice President, People and Culture, and Chief Human Resources officer for TELUS, so please welcome them to our stage. Thank you so much for taking your time to come and join us and be with us here today, if, if, if you will. Um, but uh, Karen, maybe I can start with you. Uh, and tell us, uh, you know, welcome first of all, but we know your title, you're, you're, you're the Chief Talent Officer, but how did you get there? Great question. So by way of Victoria, I grew up on the West Coast and came to Toronto um, for a break and never went home. So uh, I've been here 20, just over 20 years and uh, it's a wonderful place to have a career. So from, from my professional perspective, I started my career at Ernst & Young and then I spent some time at Coca-Cola Bottling and decided I wanted to work for a big Canadian organization that had similar values to mine. And so BMO was the place I chose because of its commitment to learning and development, because of its commitment to women and diversity, and because of its commitment to growing careers. So quite ironic that 14 years later, I get to run the talent practice as the chief talent officer. So drop for me, if you will, just what were a couple of the roles that you had as you were going through Coca-Cola and other organizations? Sure, sure. I was always, I was an HR generalist and consultant, oh. and then joined BMO as an HR business partner, spent the majority of my career in HR, and then was asked to go and be a regional vice president of banking. So I went, stepped out of the towers in downtown Toronto and went to Toronto East and ran 13 personal banking branches and really got that sense of empathy and frontline leadership that brought me back to the chief talent officer job. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey because I think a lot of the people in our audience probably are on similar trajectories, if you will. Dennis, did you start building computers in your dorm room at school or something like that? What story am I getting confused with here? No, no, not at all. No, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was Michael. Okay. Um, so Dennis Hoffman, been with Dell for 19 years and work with a team that supports our customers in Central and Eastern Canada. Um, and, you know, when I think about what, what brought me here, I think of a couple of things. I'm going to go way back, if you don't mind, if that works. McDonald's? So, not <laughs> McDonald's. Okay. But, you know, growing up and doing something outside of school that was difficult and engaging, right? So, for me, that was sports, athletics. For some people, for my oldest daughter, it's fine arts. For another, do another daughter, it's a sporto. Um, but really taking the time to play at a higher level and developing a sense of team, a sense of leadership. Most importantly, though, a sense of grit, right? And Angela Duckworth talks about grit, right? That alignment between passion and perseverance. That sport, for me, enabled me to find that, right? To really develop that. That's number one. And then number two, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs out here in the audience today. And when I was, a, when I was in university, I had my own student painting business. And what an investment in my own education, right? So massive financial investment, massive investment in time, working 70, 80 hours a week, but importantly, wearing every hat, right? HR, marketing, production, um, sales, and it really helped develop that sense of grit. But more importantly for me to get to my path to where I am today really helped me understand that I love sales and I love leadership. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're here. Robert, what about you? 
I, I will uh, go way back as well. I actually grew up in uh, small town Grimsby, uh, and uh, I had parents that believed that uh, no matter how young you were, you needed to work. Uh, so my first job, I was uh, four and uh, picked <laughs> strawberries for, I'm not lying. Uh, four years old, picking strawberries in the farm next door and then selling them to neighbors on the back of the wagon. Uh, that was the beginning of uh, my uh, sales uh, career or being involved in sales. I learned the value then of uh, how important money was. Uh, I decided that actually I would go into hospitality, so I was convinced that that was the direction that I would go. Worked at resorts in the summers um, when I was in high school, university. Uh, graduated from Guelph uh, in the hospitality program, actually. Uh, and after two years of the real world of hospitality and 18-hour days and six days a week, I decided that maybe that wasn't necessarily the direction I wanted to go. So I had a friend of mine that was in the staffing business working for a company called Robert Half. And she said, uh, you know, I think you'd be really good in this business. And uh, that's where it started in 1995. Uh, worked in a number of roles within that organization, uh, both from a, an actual operations perspective uh, through to a number of leadership positions, one that took me to the US uh, for a few years as I was leading one of the brands. Uh, spent another couple of years in a, a much larger global staffing organization and then joined LHH a year ago and uh, was really excited to make that move, um, working with an organization that offers um, total solutions for clients from a staffing perspective, so the search practice that I look after for Canada and as we move that into the US, along with our career transition and leadership development as well, so being able to offer the total human capital solution to clients. And uh, so it's been a great, uh, great journey. There we go. And again, glad that you're here today. Sandy, your business card, my goodness. Hold on. Executive Vice President, People and Culture, and oh, by the way, uh, the side job of Chief Human Resources Officer for Telus. How'd that all happen? Um, well, if I go back to my first job, um, <laughs> I was lifeguarding, but they didn't let us do that at four. I was not four. I was definitely a teenager. Um, I get asked this question a lot, too, and my answer is less... Um, conventional than what people typically expect to hear. Uh, I think if I go back to my first job, lifeguarding, uh, the one thing that stuck out for me and I realize has been a trend that I've, and a thread that it has woven through all of my career choices, is I had a bit of a mindset that said, how good can I make this? I remember in my first job, you know, thinking about how can I make this pool uh, area safer for kids, more engaging, more fun for the staff, et cetera. And I've had that mindset of how good can I make this? Um, throughout my whole career and I eventually as I got out of university stumbled my way into technology uh, organization and haven't left it since simply because of the opportunity uh, the constant pace of change the disruption uh, as we all know in this particular industry and space has just kept opening opportunities for me to ask that question how good could I make this uh, and it's just led me to to opportunity uh, um, along the way I think people talk also a lot about moving around the organization. I would add that having some stints in a mergers and acquisition uh, role for a while, uh, in some corporate strategy uh, roles for a little while as well, have continued to build out my ability to, to, to take bigger roles that, I, uh, that I'm in today. Wow. So we've got quite the uh, depth and breadth of experience here today. And so, so Sandy, if I can maybe start and work our way back this, this wave. Um, in your opinion, right now, what is the biggest challenge facing leaders today? So I think we're faced with a number of challenges, uh, and it's getting increasingly complex for leaders. And when I reflect on this question, I think it's pace of change. Uh, I just alluded to that in my last uh, answer. Um, it's really hard to have anything stay still long enough for you to feel you know, completion or momentum or to look in the rear view you know, mirror um, and think about the next move. It's just moving increasingly and exponentially so fast um, that leaders have to keep up with agile thinking and, and looking around corners and, and assessing trends um, constantly. It's probably our number one job. Uh, I read a stat, um, a KPMG study not long ago that said CEOs, 72% of CEOs said their business will change in their industry more in the next three years than it has in the last 50. And I think that speaks really impactfully to what we all face. It's a very different role. Expectations are very different than they would have been five, 10 uh, years ago. 
And there's so many different levels of that as well, right? I mean, with change, there's dealing with change as an individual contributor. Um, as a leader, you may need to manage your team through the change process, whether it be schedules and budgets or whatever it is. But then in the more strategic level, as all of you are, what's, what's our strategy? And one of our speakers has shared from the stage, if you know that you need to innovate, it's too late. The competition has already innovated. So, so Robert, what about in your world, just coming back down the wave here of the biggest challenge that you, you see leaders facing now? Sure, and you know, and I would agree uh, with Sandy. I think that the challenge of uh, organizations as they are going through transformation or they're thinking to the future, what's the next step? Can their leaders help them get there? Uh, do they have what it takes to get there? Coming from the search side of the business on the executive search side, as we talk to our clients as they're looking to hire people uh, into those roles, that's the number one, which is do they have a, a sense of agility? Um, are, are they chameleons to the extent that they can handle very complex uh, challenges or situations that are coming at them, but actually be a people leader and inspire and continue to help people in their careers and bring people together so that they can, uh, can work towards that goal. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex challenging world right now and, and an interesting comment because you know in inspiring people we use that word all the time you know like that song was so inspirational or the movie inspired me but what does the word mean you know what, what does inspire mean and and when we look back and really break it down if we were to check a respiration rate that's that's our breathing right yeah. and so I guess my question to leaders is are you breathing life into your team or are you sucking the energy out of them like a dead Duracell battery right. so <laughs> How you doing? How you doing? Right. <laughs> Dennis, what is your experience? What's, what's That's challenging? That's great. I love it. Um, you know, I'd say keeping the lights on or keeping the everyday under control while continuing to pursue the vision. Hmm. So when I, was, when I was 20 years old, I learned how to ride a motorcycle and got my license. Still enjoy it to this day. And one of the big things that you learn is where you look is where you go when you're riding. Up, when you're riding. So think of it, if you're on a country road and you're winding around, a, winding around a turn, you need to look beyond. You need to look up and beyond that turn. If you look down, you're wobbling. If you look at that tree, you're going to hit that tree. And help you, Lord, if you look at that car that's coming against you and you're fixated on that, you're going to hit the car. So where you look is where you go. And as leaders, we're inundated with so much every day. If we're focusing on our every day, we're missing the vision. We need to make sure we keep looking where we want to go. Beautiful. And in your experience? So I would say when I think about the changing needs of our customers, so 25% of our customers who join BMO now do so through a digital channel. So they don't even visit a branch. And we have the, um, here's a shameless plug, the number one app in the Canadian App Store for financial services. You can make an appointment online. Um, but when I think about that, that means our branches are less busy. And I read a stat from the World Economic Forum that 58% of, of the jobs globally will have upskilling or reskilling in the next five years. So that is something that as chief talent officer and as a leader keeps me up at night because we have a lot of people and there are some young urban professionals here in Toronto who they're just fine with that. They think innovation is cool. There are people who sit in our, our rural organizations who've worked for the same BMO branch for 28 years and they maybe have a high school education and maybe they don't and they're afraid. And so how do we help reskill and upskill our entire world workforce so that they join us in thinking about the future of work as something they're excited about. Wow. So there are truly people that are still holding on to their bank book and want their passbooks <laughs> updated? Um, absolutely. <laughs> and so we actually still do that by hand. We no longer have a machine to do that. But the number of people, and if you think about it, before I was running branches recently, I can't remember the last time I was in a branch. And yet we would have a lot of our customers, mainly seniors, who would come in and that would be their social connection. They would come in looking for crisp 50s for their grandchildren. And so we have that demographic. And then we also have people who've never set foot in a branch. When you talk about a passbook, they don't know what you're talking about. So when we think about the future of work, as a leader, you're thinking about how do you touch and bring along every single one of your employees. And uh, you, you prompted me because I, I think there may be a new issue for all of us leaders to have to deal with, and that is how do we help our individual contributors, our peers, our leader deal with fear? 
And uh, through the life coaching work that I've done, I've also learned what fear is. And it's simply an acronym that many of you probably are aware of as well, you know, that false evidence appearing real. And how do we as leaders ground our people so that they can do what they do best and bring their true gifts and talents to the workplace. So Robert, I'm gonna to come to you with, a, with an individual question here now. Corporate culture is one of the most important factors that drive high performance and innovation. We've heard two speakers talk about it today. What is your organization doing to ensure that culture remains its competitive advantage in finding new ways to succeed in a world of changing conditions? We're talking about change as well. Yeah, that's great. You know, culture definitely, I mean, it's so critical, and we did hear it today, which was, uh, which was really interesting, and, and how important it is to the overall success of the organization. And, I, you know, I reflect back, and I, you know, I, I, LHH Knightsbridge had some challenge with culture at, uh, at one point and really made the decision, what do we need to do to move forward? How do we uh, move forward with this? And uh, one of the things that we did as an organization was to um, work with a company called Pecon, uh, which is an actual engagement uh, survey. And uh, it's actually done bi-monthly, and it's fairly quick for employees to be able to use. Uh, it's very honest. Um, it's very confidential. Uh, the results are in real time, so they come back instantly. And I think what it did was put some perspective on some of the areas of opportunity. Often we hear too late when somebody resigns that there was an issue, or there was a challenge, or there was something that they didn't like. Um, PECON allows us to be able to immediately uh, dive into what that challenge is, look at trends, are there issues that are, are bigger um, within the organization, and then act on those. And so taking that next step, actually doing something about it. So uh, looking at what those results um, look like and then implementing, communicating well uh, what those uh, what those maybe those responses look like and being mm -hmm. honest about that. And then here's what we're doing about it and here's the steps. And I think organizationally have done a very good job, elevated those results um, quite well, um, implemented a number of uh, different programs that have gone um, to work towards that right from uh, you know, looking at our, our time off um, programs, um, personal time off, working from home, um, and modifying those because that came back as, as, a, as a concern. Um, our uh, country president uh, every month brings the whole organization together um, to do an update uh, where all the uh, leadership team will uh, talk a bit about their piece of the business, what they're doing, um, successes, and really sharing that and those results, which goes a long way. And people have talked about that. We want to hear more about what's going on in the company, feel part of it, feel connected to it. That helps to, to build that. And really, this all aligns with our mission and values, which, uh, you know, for us, that's making a difference in people's lives and what we do, and tying that all together and, and um, offering people time to give back uh, as well. So, you know, I think definitely a journey and, uh, and so critically important. Beautiful, thank you. And, and so what I'm hearing from you as, as you talk is, it, it's the power of a lapel pin. Um, <laughs> and you probably can't see it out there in the audience. I don't know if the camera person is able to pick it up or not, but um, Dennis, with, with the exception, we're gonna have to get you a Dell pin in some way, shape, or form. But uh, my ally here is a gay man. Thank you for wearing the pride pin for BMO. Um, Sandy, you've, you've got on an anti-bullying pin today, which is showing diversity and inclusion from a tech corporation and focusing on children. And Robert, you got uh, starfish, starfish on there yes. and sort of what I heard you talking about connect that starfish to what you just spoke about for me. What's the starfish represent to LHH Knightsbridge? So the starfish is, a, is, a, is an old story and it talks about uh, a man on the beach and as he's walking along uh, he notices another man and picking up one starfish at a time and throwing it back into the water and when he, this other man, questions him, what are you doing? He said, I'm throwing the starfish back in the water. He's like, well, you can't possibly save all of them because there's so many of them on the beach. And his response is, no, but I can help one at a time. I can save one at a time. And, uh, and really, you know, you think, of how does that translate into our business with our clients, um, those that we work with, our, the candidates, those that we help, um, and either finding opportunities or work through transition um, or through their uh, talent leadership development. And then our internal, how important that is, one person at a time, helping that person uh, achieve their goals and being uh, leaders that can help and inspire and motivate and, and keep their careers moving forward. So just a real important uh, story for us as an organization. Thank you. Thanks for sharing it. And thanks for wearing the pins as well. And Dennis, I'll give you a chance to salvage now. Do you want to say something to that? No, I love that. Okay. I love that story. Sorry, I'm I, I, taking it all in here. I do have a question for you, though. This morning that we heard about organizational alignment, and we know that cultural transformation requires a commitment from leaders to live and breathe the desired behaviors that will permeate throughout the entire organization. What is your leadership team doing to ensure impact and lasting changes to align employees with your organizational goals at Dell? So great day so far. We had Robert earlier talking about, and I don't want to get this wrong, but he said culture is the number one differentiator. 
right? I believe that's what he was talking about. Peter Drucker also said it, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and so for us, we were going, we were on, three years ago, we underwent the largest merger and acquisition in tech history between Dell and EMC. So getting culture right was really important. It was critical. Um, so, you know, at the time, I was a regional director, working with a team of salespeople, sitting across the table from people who used to be my competitors. We were partners, then we were competitors for a long time. Um, and so, naturally, I thought there's going to be a ton of conflict here. You know, certainly appreciated Leanne's discussion earlier around conflict. We got a chance to talk with her afterwards. That was great. Um, and I thought there would, there would be a big difference in the cultures. I was wrong, actually. What we did as a corporation is we went out and we surveyed 75,000 employees from both sides, legacy Dell, legacy EMC, and we got their feedback on 24 different cultural attributes, and the top five were consistent among both, both organizations, and the number one was the same among both, and that was you know, customer priority, and then winning together, integrity, innovation results, excuse me, those rounded out the rest of them. But from there, you know, then I think about some of the additional intelligence that Robert gave us earlier today. But from there, we needed to incorporate that into what we did every day. So communicate and over-communicate those cultural values through our team, through our leaders, and down to our team. And then, as he mentioned, hire, fire, and model those behaviors. Right? So for example, we have a member of our team that's hiring right now for a position in Atlantic Canada, and he's using those cultural values to bring out the questions to understand if there's a good fit. Conversely, we've had to let people go who don't meet those cultural values. They've had great results, but they haven't worked well together or didn't want to work with the team, and we had to part ways because it didn't make sense. And then from a leadership standpoint, we've developed leadership principles based on those cultural values that we train and develop our leaders against and that we also get feedback from our employees against. So people are actually measured towards the corporate values and they you've are. seen people hired based on them, but also you've seen people let go. We absolutely hire based on them. We let go, uh, we have let go people based on them. The big one is, is winning together, working together, right? If people don't wanna work together, then you know, they're not gonna fit on the team, right? There's an old saying that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Um, and so that's a big one. That's a deal breaker for us. Fair enough. And one hint I will get, give on that though, um, to that point, you know, I talk about hiring or applying. For those that are looking at a new company or they're out there applying for a job, make sure you understand what that organization's cultural values are. Mm -hmm. You'll know if there's a good fit, you'll know if you'll be happy, and you'll also want to address them through the interview process. There we go. And if we're looking for tips, um, don't just go with the title. Um, look for a definition. How, how do you define? And, and so my big favorite question is, as demonstrated by what? We value what as demonstrated by what? So Sandy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you now. Um, can you explain the impact of any that social media and technology, given that Dell is here, um, has made on your organization from a leadership perspective? Tell us, is technology. Uh, yeah, happy to do that. And um, of course, we are a technology company, and we very much believe our mission is to use technology to provide remarkable outcomes for Canadians. Many of you may not even know that we are uh, a leader in healthcare. We have started uh, to grow a sector and a line of business in agriculture. Um, so beyond just basic communication, we want to leverage technology to solve some of the biggest uh, problems that uh, we're facing in the world and certainly in can starting with Canada. So that's a, a big part of our, our social purpose is a big part of what makes it an exciting place to work. A, a way to take your product, your technology, your service and look for social outcomes um, that we can make, uh, have a role in solving. If I just focus on social media, because you asked about social media as well, just touch on that. Uh, I think we all have a love-hate relationship with social media. I'll just speak for myself. Uh, I'm on Snapchat. Um, anybody else in the room? I'm not a Gen Y. I'm clearly not a Gen X. I'm a proud Gen, or not a Gen Z. I'm a Gen X. Anybody on Snapchat? No one. So, okay. So, <laughs> but I am on Snapchat. So, social media, um, I follow my teenage nieces. Um, they thought it was really cool that I got on Snapchat until I started tapping them to say I saw pictures on Instagram I don't think are the best uh, impressions young women want to leave in the world and I give them 24 hours to take it down before I tell my sister. Um, so, 
Uh, it works really well. I troll them. I don't even tell my sister because she would lose her mind. So I just, I'm the volunteer ant that trolls them uh, on social media and it's kept a very clean uh, brand uh, image of my two teenage nieces so far. The, the oldest one's 19, so I think pretty soon we'll be, we'll be clear. Then the seven and the six year old that are my brothers, I'll have to worry on them next. So, uh, so we have a love-hate relationship with social media and, and I'll just a quick commentary from a leadership perspective to think about as you leverage social media um, the, the negative side is you can destroy your brand uh, with one activation, uh, on one Instagram note, uh, with one tweet. Um, or you can have a brand building moment uh, in terms of how you connect with the world, connect with your customers, connect with people that follow you. So it's really complex, but can be amplified for good and evil. Just one example of of challenges that we've faced as we sort of embrace letting our team members and our leaders be active in social media. We've had senior leaders retweet something of a political uh, nature that has caused us to lose customers. It's caused us to stop our business for and do nothing for two weeks, uh, but try to undo the reputational damage, handle customers that were telling us uh, that they were going to leave us as a result of just that one, you know, one day leader thinking, I'm going to retweet something that you know, a particular political party um, communicated. So it really takes on a whole other level of awareness and scrutiny and sort of think twice before you decide you're, you're going to communicate. On the plus side, it can amplify your brand and it can amplify your message in an exponential way that we could never before at a very cost effective uh, way and manner. So if I look at my own uh, CEO, Darren Entwistle's use of social media, um, he uses Instagram solely for social purpose message. Uh, and he, in a very short time, I think we got him up maybe about, truthfully, about six months ago, uh, and he has over 3,000 followers. Please feel free to follow him, Darren Entwistle. <laughs> Uh, and if you want to follow what good looks like in terms of a CEO using this thoughtfully and carefully to talk to our team members, to talk to customers, non-customers about what we stand for, our social purpose, uh, what we care about, the work we're doing in the community. So, you know, it, it, I think we, we all have learned there's a love-hate, there's complexity, it requires responsibility, but it can be a wonderful tool to connecting very quickly with thousands of, of team members and customers. There may be some people in the White House that want to talk with you about your policies on that. Yeah, um, see how they can help, hey, you can help them out. Uh, Karen, if, if I may, I would love to get a better sense of how the bank is preparing employees to be equipped for the future uh, of work. How are the leaders championing this transition to a world that's still not fully yet known? You talked about some of the older people that are struggling to let go. What about the younger people that are coming into your organization? So a great question, thank you. And I would attribute our success in this area to our really highly adaptive culture. And we know from our last employee survey that over 88% of our employees of all ages feel that we have confidence in the future as an organization. And so one of the things that we've built our learning and development platform on to upskill and reskill our employees is our Institute for Learning. And we were the first and we're the only Canadian FI to have a corporate university. And it's just up in Toronto, north of, of Steeles Avenue. 25 years old, we've offered over half a million learning hours out of that facility. And we're really proud of it, and yet we know it's not enough. It's a traditional bricks and mortar organization, but we needed to do something online. So 2018, we launched what we call BMO U with a great partner, Degreed. And so all 46,000 of our employees have access to millions of, they call them training artifacts, I'm learning all the time as well. And that is something that they can access on their phone, on their laptop, on their device. It can be something that they're curious about in their current role, something that would be a skill for the future like analytics or AI. And they can do that if they're working in a branch and there's no lineup, they can do that on the GO train on the way home. And so that's something that we've got a lot of great feedback about 
over half of our employees are on BMOU on a regular basis, and we deliver over 6,000 hours per month of upskilling to our employees through that online agile tool. And then we've recently, just in the last couple of months, launched BMO Forward, which is a more traditional online learning vehicle focused on some of the skills that we think we'll need for the future, like AI, like cyber, like fraud. And we have two streams, one for our technical experts. They can go deep and learn more about their domain of choice. And then for, for the non-experts like me and the bankers and the corporate people, they can learn just a bite-sized snap about something that they may want to learn about, like fraud, for example. And they can do that on their device or on their laptop in the office. And so that's given our people confidence in learning more about the new skills that are coming in the future. And then um, Sandy mentioned purpose, and I just wanted to talk a bit about that as well. And while it not, may not seem directly related, we've launched BMO's purpose, which is to boldly grow the good in business and in life. Say that again for us. Boldly grow the good in business and life. And so there are three planks to that purpose. One is an inclusive society, two is a sustainable future, and three is a thriving economy. And so we, we believe that to be important because in the face of constant change, where you can't tell any employee what skills they're going to need for the next 10, 20 years, they know the values, and, and all of my colleagues have talked about the values of the organization. And so that's the North Star, that they know if they join BMO or their employee at BMO, what we stand for, and that's something that really aligns them to the future future of work, no matter where it takes us. Beautiful. Thank you. I like that. And I especially like the North Star, because it's only available in North America. You can't see it in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, it's used to guide us, right? It's used for navigation. So uh, I have one more question for all of you that I'm coming into the audience. So have your questions ready. I'm going to be down there in just a second. And Dennis, if we can start with you, work our way through, and then come back to Karen. Um, in one, uh, sorry, what is one characteristic that you believe is integral for every leader to possess? You know, I'd say be a lifelong learner. And I think probably everybody who's here is embracing that because we're all here to learn. But I think it's critical, you know, for our own de development, be a lifelong learner, always be curious, and listen with the intent to learn, mm. right? How often do we find folks, we were having a conversation at lunch about this actually, how often do we find people who are listening, or we do it ourselves, just waiting for a turn to talk? or waiting for our turn to give our point of view because we're leaders and we have a point of view and we want to share it and we're missing the opportunity to learn. So listen with the intent to learn. I actually had some customers down at our head office in Austin recently. You asked about Michael. We had Michael come in and I was really impressed at how much time and how curious he was about the customer, about their challenges and about what they're going through and learning from them rather than just talking about all the great things that we can do. So our best leaders are our best listeners, and they're always curious. Thank you. Do you leave anything left for you, Robert? What have you got? Have you got anything? One, yeah, one characteristic good. you believe is integral for every leader to possess? I would say uh, strong communication skills. So um, that ability to be able to communicate difficult messages, as we heard today, um, but it be inspirational, um, be able to motivate, um, have the tough conversations when they come up, but also deliver well the objectives, the uh, performance, the goals of the organization and then be able to work to those. So I think it ties in perfectly and uh, you know, just so critical in, in uh, today's world. Beautiful. Sandy, thoughts? I agree with both these answers. It's as difficult as the question, if you're stranded on a desert island, what's the one thing you would bring? And you list five quickly. Uh, so these are both great examples. The one that came to mind right away was integrity, uh, because I feel integrity is just kind of a foundational uh, layer that, that you need to bring with you in any circumstance, in any situation. Uh, and that means knowing who you are, coming as you are, bringing your values and your whole self to work, staying grounded no matter you know what happens, what the situation is, or the circumstances you find yourself in, always root back to integrity. Because the one and only thing you ever have in, throughout your career that it belongs to you is your brand is your leadership brand and it's formed on years of people watching your integrity, hopefully your integrity, not your lack thereof, but the consistency in how you show up. Uh, and once you have that integrity and it's displayed as one of your strongest attributes or a consistent attribute, what comes with that is all kinds of 
opportunity. So that would be my foundation, the one thing I'd take to the desert island. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Karen, what about for you? Mine is a build on what Sandy just said. As a leader, help each of your employees bring his or her or their authentic self to work. Mm -hmm. And so creating an environment of psychological safety where people can come into your organization, and we spoke about this earlier, and really contribute their best. And I think as leaders, that's what we owe our people. So what about courage? What do you think? Do you embody courage here on the stage? Are you ready? I have no idea what they're going to ask you. And so good luck, uh, I guess is what I would say. Um, let's take a few questions from the audience. Who's got one? Raise your hand. Always at the back of the hall. It's always the one at the back of the hall. Hi. I have a quick question. I have my own training company. We work a lot with training around diversity and inclusion. We've talked so much today about the culture. And where do you stand with the cultural fit? We all talk about it. We hire someone who is a cultural fit. And where does innovation come in? Because I find we keep hiring the same person over and over and over, expecting different results. Who's going to take it? Um, I, I can give it. I can give it a shot. It's. Um, I'm actually going to reference the, la the last remark I made. We create a environment of psychological safety where people can bring their authentic self to work. And so, while our purpose defines, and I talked about it earlier, who we are as an organization, and people can opt in or opt out as they see fit, um, it allows them to bring their authentic self to work and feel safe. And then they're able to be bolder. They bring forward good ideas. They can innovate more effectively. And so, I think um, creating a consistent culture culture defined by values, and we've all talked about that, doesn't mean that you're looking for cookie cutter images of one another. I think it's just how you activate those values. And so one little story that I wanted to talk about in this vein, and, and we talked about my, um, my pride pin that I'm wearing. When we launched our pride pins, and so this is something that talks about culture and values. When we launched the pride pins and then our LinkedIn logo turned from being BMO Blue to Pride for, for Pride Month. We had a number of our employees who came forward and said, this isn't me. I don't believe in this. I'm a conservative Christian, and I don't believe in what you're standing for. And that was their opportunity to voice what they believed. It was our opportunity to hear them and respect them and create a psychologically safe environment for them to speak up. But also we were clear that as an organization, as BMO Financial Group, in every country in which we operate, Pride is our value. So in that instance, I'm giving it as an example, we didn't stifle their voice, we didn't stifle their, their perspective or their ability to innovate and say something different, but we did stand for our values. So just uh, one example about voice. And so to add on to that, you know, we're, we're talking about corporate culture, and I apologize because I'm ha getting some echo back here. It was hard to understand the question, but we're talking about corporate culture to our team members, that's what we expect of them. You're talking about your culture, right? What, what BMO stands for, what we expect of them. But then the initiatives you're talking about, we, can, we call it our people philosophy. That's what our people can expect from us, right? So the things like talent development, rewards and recognition, work-life balance, diversity inclusion programs, right? So it, go, it goes both ways. We, we provide an environment where people can do their best work and be their best, and then we're going to attract the best people, and then we're going to want them to stick around because they're living up to their potential. Are there more questions from the audience? I certainly have more I can go on stage and ask, but I want to give you the opportunity to engage with these executives. Raise your hand if you have a question for us. Ah, yes, thank you. And again, it's at the back of the hall. I'm so glad I didn't do yoga this morning. I'm getting my run in now. My Fitbit is happy. And where'd that hand go? There it is. So good afternoon. I just want to know your views on the all-knowing or all-pervading leader. And do you think a leader needs to be all-knowing in order to be effective? And if they're in a forum where they don't know, do you think they lose credibility? You know, I would I would answer to say no. They don't need to be all knowing um, because I don't know that anybody is. 
Um, but I would also say that a humble leader, um, which is very important, um, you know, one of the characteristics that we talk about, um, who knows what they know and what they don't, um, is able, in, uh, able to impart that wisdom um, when they know it and lead, um, when they don't to learn and be open to learning. Um, not only how to do that, but to learn from those on their team um, to be able to, to move forward. I, you know, I would give an example that I, uh, we're, we're evolving into a more digital world uh, within the organization that's not my core strength as a leader, and I'm learning from somebody who is literally right out of school um, as um, a marketing person that has joined us, first job. He knows more than I will ever know um, in that space, and in order to be able to be a good leader, I need to learn from him so that we can lead that change and, uh, and learn what he brings to the table, and uh, it's, been, it's been great. Um, so I would say absolutely not. Yeah, and I, sorry, Sandy, go ahead. Just if I may just top up, I love that, that notion of learning from someone in your team that has uh, a skill set that's not your forte. I once heard someone say, try to have someone around you in every generation. Um, so, you know, make friends with someone in that teenage, 20, whatever, whatever decade or generation, make sure that you've got people, not necessarily always around your team, but just in your life, um, so that you keep getting uh, very di diverse perspectives and exposure to things that otherwise is not in your, your radar. Another expression I heard years ago that stuck with me was, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but you do have to be the person in the room that the smart people want to be with. So I think you know it's a, it's a it's an insightful question. I think a leader that's all knowing, um, by definition, it's impossible. So that just means they think they're all knowing, and that's probably the most dangerous kind of leader at all. So, you know, thank you for the question, and um, it's really quite the opposite of that notion in today's leadership. Yeah, and I'm going to support that with kind of a hard no, if you will, and a quick soundbite. Um, our founder, Michael Dell, he's got a saying that says, if you're the smartest person in the room, find another room. <laughs> uh, panel to your far left. Far left here. Our final question. Thank you. Um, so you, we talk about values. You all mentioned culture. Um, Dennis, you had mentioned earlier about the motorcycle run. So you're looking you know, in front of you, and your eyes are going to, go to uh, lead you to where you're going. So as leaders, I have a question. Um, for our company, we started small and very quickly over the last five years, six years, grew right across North America. And one of the things that I loved about the company was the fact that uh, the CEO always had an open door. But we've grown so quickly and so big, I find there's a disconnection between our frontliners and who is the CEO and the CFO and where we used to communicate with them directly. Um, how do you deliver that message to the frontliners to know that you're still human, that we can talk to you, that there aren't 14 barriers to try to get to you. And how do you continue to build that culture? Because that's a big issue for, I think, one of the biggest issues for us. It's that culture and making everybody understand that what we're doing is because the top wants us to do it and they're always available to, uh, you know, to welcome any questions that the team has. Thank you. So congratulations on your success. That's a success story you should be proud of. And so I work for a massive company that feels like a tiny company. And some of the things I would talk specifically about is as much as it sounds counterintuitive, you need a deliberate culture plan once you get to a certain size. And I'm sure you're feeling this way, is doing what we've always done isn't going to get us where we need to go. And so just assuming that the cultural norms that made you successful as a smaller entrepreneurial company, I, I would take some of the values that are embedded in that feeling of camaraderie and that feeling that you all have as you built this company together and figure out how to port them into a human culture plan for your larger organization. Um, one tactical example that, that I'll share is um, the team I had before this one or I guess before the one before that, was um, distributed all around the world. And so I would, on Sunday afternoon, put my iPhone on my island in my kitchen and tell my family to leave me alone, and I would film a five-minute video. And I would send it out, and it wasn't pretty. I was sometimes in sweatpants, but it was just me talking about what was going on. And the reactions that I got to that were, one, the social media and the marketing team were like, oh my god, Karen, you've got to stop doing this. <laughs> and the people on my team were so appreciative. And then other leaders started doing that same thing. So that's, that's one example. 
Another example for creating that sense of connection is um, in smaller organizations, and most of us have worked in them at one point in our career, you had coffee with people. And once you get over a certain size, you can't do that, but you actually always can. And so we have on my team, which is 700 people, we have virtual coffees. And so everybody has an accountability to have a virtual coffee once a month, and sometimes it's over Skype, and sometimes you don't see the person, you're just over the phone. But it creates that sense of human connection, which is, I think, probably what you're missing as your company's been so successful and has grown so big. Well, you're really making me think about um, two movies. One is The Elephant Man and his very famous line, I am a human being. In spite of his deformities, he was a human being. Or in spite of his differences, he was a human being. And so to your leaders in your organization, they are human beings as well. But the other movie that comes to mind is The Devil Wears Prada. And in that movie, everyone was afraid to ride the elevator with Amanda Priestley, Meryl Streep. And so I think often in huge corporations like all of you are in, visibility is one of the biggest challenges of how do you get the human being into the environment? How, how do you let people know in that culture? So as a final question for you, because our time is up, I'm going to ask you in a word. Um, as we look at leadership moving forward, in a word, what are you most excited about? Sandy, you want to kick it off? Because they stole all your good ideas before. So give us a word. Uh, social purpose, leading capitalism. Thank you. Uh, uh, inspiring uh, a team to change. I love their words. This is so good. Yeah, <laughs> inspiring a team to change. I love it. I Dennis. One word <laughs> it's, it's really this next generation of leaders that, is, that are coming up. Beautiful. The future, next generation. To boldly grow the good in business and life. Oh, I love how you tied it together. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your executive panel today. Thank them, thank them, thank them. Thank you so much for your time.